welcome back into the Red Zone Podcast. My name is Colton Bartholomew, UW football beat reporter here for the Wisconsin State Journal. Joined by longtime beat reporter, now columnist Jim Polzine. We're doing a quick episode this week, a little bit of a slower time on the football side of things here as uh, the Badgers are taking a little time off and uh, they just got their bowl assignment here going to the Las Vegas Bowl against Arizona State down in Las Vegas, obviously, playing at Allegiant Stadium, the home of the Raiders. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some Arizona State thoughts. Not going to get too deep into it, but we'll talk about a little bit about Arizona State and then talk a little bit about Heisman voting because, uh, you know, there's a couple of Big Ten guys that are going to be in New York at the end of this week here uh, for the Heisman voting, but there's one who is not, who is getting a lot of attention. So uh, going to talk about that as well. Jim, before we dive in too deep or anything, just what's uh, what is the feeling that you get just – fan-wise and in general about this game and in the Vegas Bowl itself? Yeah, not much interest. I just haven't gotten really much feedback at all. I think people are still salty from the loss to Minnesota and how that really changed the perspective of the season. Uh, Personally, uh, that assignment came out and I was um, selfishly very disappointed. I, I was pulling for Nashville just for the city aspect of it, the easier travel aspect of it, maybe a little better opponent. Um, this, this Vegas bowl just does nothing for me. And, and, and the kick and probably what's, what's dictating this is that it's a nine thirty PM central start. And that's not great for us. I was just about to say, in talk about selfishly in this whole nine thirty start where, you know, the, the dedicated fans who stay up and watch the game, you know, applaud them. I don't think they're sticking on Madison.com for a couple hours after the game to, right. you know, get our, our hot takes afterwards. So, yeah, on that front, not awesome, but we will talk about that bowl and that selection process, which I thought was a little interesting too. So we'll get into all of that right after this. All right, Jim, so I want to talk about this bowl game quick with the, the Las Vegas Bowl. Uh, you know, going into the weekend, checking out everybody's bowl projections and everything, Wisconsin had a pretty solid path, and especially after Michigan won the Big Ten handily and kind of set things in order at the top of the Big Ten. I thought Wisconsin had a pretty solid path to the Outback Bowl in terms of number of wins and the, and the quality of some of their wins and the quality of their losses, in all honesty, if you just look at some of these other teams that were, were in contention. But then the Outback Bowl goes with Penn State and Arkansas. Arkansas, that was kind of where everybody slotted them from the SEC. Were you surprised were surprised with the Penn State pick? Because I kind of was. Yeah, I was too. I mean, just – and I guess I maybe you can enlighten me on the selection process in general. Like what – does this really come down to just traveling? I mean, like Penn State travels better probably than anybody in that mix for that game. Is that what it came down to, you think? I think it did. And I think – so obviously when you're talking about the power – or the, uh, the New Year's Six Bowls, the, the playoff, there's a very strict selection process there like – you know the the new the Michigan's in the power of the playoff because of what they've done, and Ohio State gets the Rose Bowl because they're the second or the the next highest Big Ten team that wasn't uh, in the playoff, and then Michigan State in the Power Five or getting a uh, New Year's Six game because they're um, you know pretty highly ranked in the College Football Playoff. So from my reading of everything, the Citrus Bowl is the top of the non New Year's Six bowls for the Big Ten, and that's where Iowa ended up, which that makes sense. Division winner, the the fourth highest ranked team in the conference after those top three, so that's where I was starting to get into the okay. So now we're in the five to seven range where you're talking about Michigan or Minnesota, Wisconsin, Penn State. They all have you know Purdue. Purdue's in there as well, obviously. Yep. Um, Penn State has that three point win over Wisconsin, and I don't know how much that played into the factor. I think, like you said, the traveling was was a bigger deal in that. But I do wonder. If there was a, hey, this is a coin flip between Penn State and Wisconsin, Penn State has that win over them, and you know you look at the, the Penn State's other losses outside of maybe, let's see, who they lost. They lost to Illinois. Yeah, yeah, Illinois was their bad loss, but everybody else makes sense. You right, know, they, they right. lost to you know, the Ohio States, the, the Michigans, the, the Michigan States of the world. So it was like, I think resume was pretty much equal, and they kind of just balanced out with okay, Mich- or we think Penn State's going to show up more for this game than and is a name will. brand too. I mean, yeah. like that's Wisconsin fans are going to want to hear that, but Penn State is still more of a name brand, and and from a TV ratings perspective, I guess I get I understand that one. Yeah, and it's interesting though with, when you're talking about the TV ratings and everything because so this Las Vegas Bowl is pretty pretty new. I mean, it's a, it's a renamed from a bowl that's been around for a while, but it's new in the sense that it's in the Big Ten rotation. And you're going to see it every odd year. So this being 2021, an odd year. This is in the rotation. 
uh, takes out the Duke's Mayo Bowl, which Wisconsin was in last year. That's going to be an even year rotation. Um, I just, to me, the clearly the the Las Vegas Bowl, and you read some of their things on uh, their site. Was, their whole direction was let's get a bigger name because this used to be like Pac-12 and Mountain West because it's a West Coast game and they're trying to get fans that are closer. But the idea is let's try to elevate this bowl, getting a, a pretty good Big Ten team or a pretty good SEC team every year in here against the Pac-12 or if there's a really good Mountain West team. I just don't know if it's going to work in all honesty. Right, and can I go back a little bit? And again, my ignorance is going to show a little bit because uh, I've been my mind's been elsewhere with other teams and stuff. Did Vegas Bowl have – First pick over the Music City Bowl. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So because that's went, that 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 I didn't totally know that, and when I saw that Purdue landed in the Music City Bowl, uh, that to me was kind of a head scratcher. So yeah, it makes sense to me now that Vegas would want Wisconsin. And and what I'll say this is, uh, I don't know that a lot of Wisconsin fans from the actual state of Wisconsin are going to travel to this game, but Vegas is close enough to Vegas, San Diego, Phoenix. Um, they might draw in some alum from from those areas, California, California yeah. in general. Yeah, uh, so I think I think and Wisconsin fans typically in the past have traveled out to Vegas. That was a regular non conference road trip for for this program. So I can understand totally from the Vegas part why they'd want Wisconsin. Yeah, and we, we've just seen very recently Wisconsin will be able to draw some fans. They, they had a good contingent at the Maui Invitational that was played down there in Vegas. So. We'll see how that all ends up kind of shaking out. Just kind of an interesting mix in here with this, this Vegas Bowl becoming uh, a Big Ten option. And apparently now it's going to be a relatively high one because if you look at, you know, I know in the official standings, Wisconsin ended up sixth in the Big Ten when you look at overall and Big Ten record and things like that, sixth or seventh. So when you have three that are in the playoff or New Year's six, so then you're talking about one of your top teams off of that, the Vegas Bowl is going to be a uh, somewhat regular destination for teams in this tier where you're talking about, you know, scratching the surface or trying to punch into that, that New Year's Six level and then being right here. So I, I I don't know, maybe this becomes somewhat regular in odd years at Wisconsin if they're not, you know, having an up year that the, the Vegas Bowl becomes a a more regular type of thing. But Yeah, it might be. And I know some people I know were interested in going and then the flights were ridiculous. And we found that out too when we we're booking our tickets for coverage uh, it just was unbelievable how expensive tickets were out of madison i'm actually going to fly out of chicago uh because it was like the, it was way way cheaper i know patricus is flying out of milwaukee mm. you know so it, it, like even if you wanted to even if you had the um desire to hey let's go take a quick three-day trip out to vegas watch the badgers and you know, enjoy some some sun and some gambling i think that just the prices turn people off yeah it's it's gonna be interesting and that kind of raises a question to me about these mid-tier bowls in general. I, I'm somewhat worried about the future of these. I, there's so much TV money and there's so much money in having an extra game and all this stuff. And there's so much uh, coaches' contracts and bonuses and all these things tied into having a bowl. I'm not saying that these bowls are going to go away in, in any sense. But I'm just, I just don't know what the future of these is outside of, hey, it's just a kind of a money grab. Because uh, it's always at, been that way, right? I agree. It's just kind of we're at a point now where we're we've t- written about in, in our paper and others like the the attendance issues for home games, you know, for for the Badgers and some other teams. It's like I, it, it's to me, it'd be a little bit odd if you're a Badger fan and say, "Hey, for the money that I'm going to spend, I'd rather go spend it on essentially an exhibition game against an outside conference school versus a conference game at home." And adding in the travel and all the hassle of that, but I don't know. I, I guess to me, there's just there's the viability of some of these games and how they look. Maybe you don't have to do it in NFL stadiums or some of these bigger ones. Like I, I don't know. I think there's going to be some changes coming to those mid tier bowls just to do something a little bit different moving forward. Yeah, maybe. Although I've been wondering that for years because I'd go down to um, bowl cover bowl games and you'd look around and they're just you know. There was tons of empty stands. There were a lot of giveaways just to get that number of people in there in the first place. Uh, so I always kind of did wonder if you know if you know if the bowls would decrease in number, and they've only increased. You yeah, know, they, they added they, one last minute. Exactly, they just pulled one out of thin air because they had enough six wins teams to do it. Right, and I think what that shows, and this is you can kind of make this comparison to um, attendance at home games, is that that is only a very small piece of the revenue picture. The more important piece. I shouldn't say important is not the right word there, but in terms of bean counters is TV money. And these bowl games are drawing corporate sponsors and 
ratings and money that way. So that's why I don't know that they'll ever. I mean, it, it's only ever going to go away if the if these corporations start saying, "Nah, it's not worth our money to invest in name sponsorships and stuff like that." So I don't know. I I'm I'm curious. Like I've wondered how the bubble hasn't burst for a lot of like coaches' salaries. I thought yeah. this would be the year that the bubble would burst, right? After COVID, went the opposite way. It went the exact opposite way, and it's just it's crazy. So I don't know. How about Crystal Ball, man? That that honestly, I mean, obviously all the the big name poaching has been going on for a couple of weeks now, but the whole the way that the whole thing went down with Miami and Crystal Ball and all that stuff that just that is so dirty to Manny to Manny Diaz and just I, I'm stunned because now the Pac-12 is Lincoln Riley in the ghost of Chip Kelly, right? <laughs> uh, two things there. The I don't feel bad for Manny Diaz who took the Temple job a couple sure, years yeah, back and left three weeks later, right? There. I don't know if you read this. There's actually – I don't know if it was The Athletic or somebody had a story about where all this Miami money is coming from. And it's coming from like the hospital system, which got uh, a ton of revenue from like COVID and stuff like that. And and and, and um, I can't think of the word. But there, there's all this money now, like $400 million or it might be even more than that. And that's in part why they're willing to pay Diaz's buyout, pay Cristobal's buyout at Oregon – and also give him a really healthy salary, yeah, and people huge are just kind of like assistant pool. right. So when you say dirty, I think it it goes even beyond um, letting a guy kind of hang there and not know whether he has a job or not, and then ultimately firing him. Um, it's just it's it's dirty. It's gotten really dirty. That's nuts, man! Yeah. Wow. All right. So moving on from that, let's jump into yeah. Arizona State. Moving a on to bit. something less dirty. <laughs> yeah. Let's well. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. I'm not a big fan of this Arizona State program. If you guys remember early on in the season, they've been under investigation pretty much all year uh, for throughout the entire 2020 season recruiting like normal, like sending guys on the road, bringing recruits in, doing things that were just not only outright against the rules, but straight up dangerous. Yeah. Like <laughs> the, the whole – and everybody seems to love Herm Edwards because they remember him on TV and the whole, you know, uh, you play to win the game and all that stuff. I'm just – I don't know. This 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 team is is interesting. So, I guess we're not going to dive too deep because we've got a lot of time to do that, and we're going to have a you know total game breakdown show uh, the week of the game. But you look at it, the Badgers are a touchdown favorite between you know six and a half, seven points, depending on where you look. To me, the biggest thing in this game, and I think it's partially why the line is where it's at, Rashad White, their do it all tailback, is sitting out getting ready for the NFL draft. Uh, he was their leading rusher. He had 1,006 yards, uh, 15 TDs this year on the ground. He was their second leading receiver with 43 catches and 456 yards. So he's going to be sitting out, and he was, you know, I thought I'd watch a ton of Arizona tape, uh, Arizona State tape yet, but you just watch their plays. It's almost every play is either a fake to him, a, a toss to him. It, it, getting him the ball was a number one priority for for their offense. And then when you move down the list, you're thinking, okay, then you've got DeMonte uh, Tranium, who was their number two guy and was kind of the spellback for Rashad White. Now he's in the transfer portal, and that's your third leading rusher, 402 yards and six touchdowns. This is going to be an offense that has to do something completely different and asking a ton of new guys to step up, a rushing offense, I should say, because they're a very run-heavy team against the number one rushing defense in the country. That all bodes pretty well for Wisconsin, in my opinion. Yeah, which and we'll make our picks at a later time. But uh, I didn't even know the spread until I came in and asked you, and you said the spread seven. Um, th- that seems shockingly low, given what we know already about who's not playing for Arizona State. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think it's just a lack of faith in the Badgers scoring a bunch of points. Sure. Which who would who would ever have that lack of faith? <laughs> yeah, uh, coming off that thirteen point, you know, just. Fireworks show up in Minneapolis. Uh, I think partially, too, Arizona State's defense has been pretty solid. Um, but sticking on Wisconsin's defense here, just because I, I wrote it down, I want to make sure I get it out there. Wisconsin can set the program record for rushing defense this year if they hold Arizona State to 85 yards or lower. Which is going to be tough, just like I mentioned. Arizona State runs the ball a ton, and that's a big part of their offense. But it goes to the point that we've been making for the last couple of weeks. This defense is one of the top of all time in Wisconsin history. It's just when you look at record and the results of the season, it's just not going to be remembered that way. Right, unfortunately, because of the 8-4 the and four record that you're going to um – you're going to remember that. And you're also going to remember the last two games where the defense just wasn't as good as, as we thought it might be. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's – I don't know. Like I, what, I got a question. I'm going to completely change subjects. 
if you're Paul Chris, how do you treat this game? Normal game? Or do you start to take a look at some guys who you're going to need from you know going forward? That's tough, and it depends. I think it depends on the position. I think there are some that's going to be normal, like you, you don't mess with the offensive and defensive lines. I don't think. I, I feel like at linebacker, you have to give Jack Sanborn the respect that he deserves in his last college game, which I mean, theoretically he has one more left if he wanted to come, or one more season left if he wanted to come back. But I don't see that happening. You don't know what Leo Chanel's status is going into next year. He's been mum on it all year. He's just said he's focused on the season. Typical thing there. But it's kind of be interesting, like, how do you balance out, like, giving the guys that the reward, right, of playing in the bowl game, playing in their last game of this season versus, hey, we've got a bunch of guys that we need to get on the field and get game speed ready. Now, maybe you don't you, – you could argue that you can't do that in one game in a bowl game in a situation like this, but – and then you've got time in the spring to do it. I just think that there are positions, like outside linebacker, who's going to replace Noah Burks next year, you know, Inside linebacker, we'll see if Jordan Turner is healthy for the game. Like there are other positions that need to get some reps. Cornerback, especially if both those guys end up leaving, we'll see what happens there. We we've seen the safeties get enough rotation on defense, but there are a lot of positions. Wide receiver is another one. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like my my when I was when I asked that question and I was listening to your answer, the two names that popped up for me are Marcus Allen. Mm-hmm. I want to see more of him, um, and I would say running back too. Like. I, I don't know that we need to see a heavy dose of Braylon Allen. I'd like to see Julius Davis because we don't know Ches Malusi's status. Like we don't know if he'll be ready for the opener. So I, I'd like to see what I have in in Julius Davis. Give him you know maybe eight to ten carries instead of the two to three that he probably typically would get. Yeah, it, I, it, I think it's all going to depend on the score too. Because not that I think Paul Chris is on the hot seat by any means from the UW you know Kellner Hall type of people. But from the outside, if they were to like, you know, do some of these things, but not use Braylon Allen a lot and kind of mix and match, and then they're not doing well in the game, like then it's just going to be more heat on Paul Christ. I think it's going to be a balance of like, all right, let's try to get a lead here, then mix in some guys that need to we need to see out here because they have to win this game. And all if if you finish this season eight and five, the way that things were, just program wide, I think it just adds so much heat going into this offseason, it's it's detrimental to, to the progress you're trying to make. Yeah, that's fair. All right, quick other note on Arizona State's offense. Uh, dual threat quarterback uh, Jalen Daniels, or Jaden Daniels, excuse me, uh, he's pretty good. He's a good runner in his threat of running. It's a little bit like um, Noah uh, Vedral from Rutgers where his threat of running – changes everything, every play. So even though he's not that great of a thrower, like he's all right, he can get the ball deep, not super accurate middle to, to short passes against some solid defenses, but the fact that he's a threat to run every play is going to mess up guys and change the zones that you have to play. So that's something that we've seen Wisconsin struggle with over the years, and Jim Leonard's going to have to do some things this in this bowl game to try to keep him in the pocket a little bit more, or at least when he's on the run, make sure somebody's close to him and doesn't let him – you know, run around and, and make uh, his defensive backs cover for too long. And then I do want to say, I, I think this is the most physical team. The Badgers are going to be the most physical team Arizona State has played all season. You go back and look at through their schedule. The two other most physical teams I think they played, BYU, that was a 10-point loss. And then Utah, that was a 14-point loss. So I think that there's going to be a physical advantage in the trenches for Wisconsin. Not that there's anything too new for them, but I think just the the matchup here, offense versus defense here for Arizona State and Wisconsin, a lot of things are trending toward Wisconsin's way, assuming everybody's there right. when that game comes. We'll see if there's anybody that sits out or decides to transfer between now and then, but assuming the Badgers have the defense they've had all year, they've got a lot of advantages here. Speaking of Braylon Allen, too, I want to see how healthy he is because he clearly, I, I don't know that, I don't know how effective he would have been in the Big Ten title game had they gotten to that point. I mean, he was limping around pretty good by the end of the year. So, But, I mean, this there is plenty of time. He's had, he would have had four weeks to rest, so uh, we should get a closer to fresh Braylon Allen for that game. Yeah, for sure. All right, and as we tease at the top of the show, I want to talk a little bit about Heisman voting because this has been a, a big topic of discussion around college football the last you know, 24-ish hours since the, the Heisman finalists have been announced. And... The Heisman finalists start with Bryce Young from Alabama. You've got Kenny Pickett from uh, Pittsburgh. You've got 
uh, C.J. Stroud from Ohio State, and then Aiden Hutchinson from Michigan. So you've got some Big Ten representation there in Hutchinson and Stroud. A lot of question marks, a lot of people, a lot of Michigan people <laughs> upset yeah. about uh, Kenneth Walker, the running back from Michigan State, not being a finalist. He led the Power 5 in rushing with 1,636 yards. He was tied for 8th in the FBS with uh, 18 rushing touchdowns, but the leader was 20, so it wasn't like he was super fi- far off being tied for 8th. Disclosure here, Jim and I both vote for the Heisman. We're not allowed to talk about who we voted for um, ahead of when the Heisman gets announced. But we can both tell you that Kenneth Walker was not on our ballots. And we're, we're fine saying that because because it's somebody that we didn't vote for. And... The, the larger point of this discussion I want to have, people that are mad about Kenneth Walker, I don't think they understand the argument they're trying to make. If they're arguing that Kenneth Walker had this such an outstanding season that he deserved to, to be a, a Heisman candidate, eh, you know, we'll, we're going to get into that in a second. But the other part of their argument, I and I don't think that they're you know, making this one as loudly, is that running backs just have it tougher. Right. Like, if you're going to be a running back that wins the Heisman, you have to have this outstanding season, and you have to probably score 30-ish touchdowns. It's it's a higher bar to clear than I think for other positions. And is that fair? I don't know. That doesn't really matter. The point is, they have a higher bar to clear, and I don't think Kenneth Walker cleared it this year. No, I don't. I was He was certainly in the running for me um, late in the season, and then you know they lost some games. I think if Michigan State is the Big Ten champion, then there's a stronger case for him. Uh, is that not fair? Probably. And this is where I'm going to welcome all our Michigan State listeners in case they catch wind of this and, and want to listen in. Um, I'm going to go I, – I know we're not supposed to say who we voted for. I do think those rules are a little bit gray. I'm going to say who was – in my final three. I think we can say that without saying who exactly I voted for. And Aiden Hutchinson from Michigan was in my final three, which is going to anger Michigan State fans even more. But it also proves that position bias is not an issue here. I, I, I have a defensive end among my final three. Right. Uh, I just think he was more impactful. Uh, the fact his team won the Big Ten title probably you know, played a role in my decision. But Jonathan, like we, you've got this in your notes. I, you know, you can vouch that I've mentioned this off air before I even mm-hmm. saw your notes. Jonathan Taylor had three better seasons than Kenneth Walker and never got to New York City as a finalist. So, it, you're right. It's it's just a bigger, it's just a bigger standard to meet if you're a running back. Quarterbacks have a much more difficult job, and so I'm naturally going to lean to quarterbacks. But this year, I really, I, I kind of expanded my look at, you know, what else can I get on there? And that's why I thought it was important to get a defensive player on there. I, I actually considered um, Bryce Young actually was one of my finalists from Alabama, but I considered their receivers because mm-hmm. I had voted for a receiver last year. And Same. I'm like, you know, and I voted for receivers. And I voted for Larry Fitzgerald over Jason White back in whatever year that was because um, I thought Larry Fitzgerald was the best player in the country that season. So I – there's no position bias as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I just, you know, just didn't see that. I, I just didn't think Kenneth Walker had done enough to get one of my three spots. I'm with you there. And the Taylor argument, maybe it's because we were up close and personal, and you know, you saw every snap of Jonathan Taylor's career basically, right. and I saw the, the the 2019 season, which was you would argue, his, I could argue, his best. Jonathan Taylor was more important to the Wisconsin offense than I think Kenneth Walker was to. Penn, or Michigan State's this year, and obviously Michigan State's offense was built around Kenneth Walker, but I would argue Michigan State has better or has as good or better quarterback and receiver talent this year. And look at the the All Big Tens. Look at the AP All Big Ten that's about to come out this or it's coming out this week. Look at some of these receivers that Jalen or that uh, uh, Kenneth Walker and Michigan State has. That's better than anybody Jalen Berger played with outside of we're well, not Jalen Berger Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, Jonathan Taylor okay. played with outside of uh, Quintez Cephas. You know, it's like I, I don't, I don't think you can say Kenneth Walker was just carrying this Michigan State team when you look at the receivers that they had and the, some of the numbers they put up. Whereas you look at Jonathan Taylor's seasons, I, especially like you go back to 2017 when all like, a bunch of the receivers were hurt and they're leaning on freshmen like or retro freshmen like Pryor and, and right. Davis and these guys. Jonathan Taylor was. About all they had. And I just think that you go back and look in 2017, 
Jonathan Taylor was sixth in the Heisman voting. 18, he was ninth. 19, he was fifth. Never made it to New York. I, it's not some massive, I think, conspiracy against running backs or like saying that Kenneth Walker didn't have a great season. It's just a higher bar to clear. And Jonathan Taylor had better years and never got the same thing. So th- to me, I I don't think that Michigan State fans and, and people that are clamoring f- uh, about this injustice or whatever just understand the argument they're trying to make. Right. I'm. Um, you know, I... <laughs> You almost have to have two thousand yards and, like you said, like twenty-five to thirty touchdowns just to even get. And the funny thing is that running backs used to be that used to dominate. Right? It used to be a running back every year, and then right. that shifted, and now it's mostly quarterbacks. But I do think Heisman voters are open-minded to other positions. I don't know who do you think is going to win, Bryce Young? I think Bryce Young is. I think a lot of Heisman voters probably were on the fence going into championship weekend and sure. then watching what he did to the Georgia defense. I think that's probably going to be enough to push him over the edge. Yeah, that's totally fair. I you know, I considered him, I considered Hutchinson, uh Kenny Pickett from Pitt had a really good season for a team that won its you know, won its conference the ACC. Um I I considered Kenneth Walker for my three finalists. The Alabama receivers, both of them, and that's the another thing. Um I I did not have CJ Stroud in my final three and in part because uh, I don't think that he's the best player on that team, oh, and he's certainly not. Yeah. Right, and so this, and that's you know, I've had that struggle for years with voting. Is that this goes to the most? I think the ballot says the outstanding player in college football, right? And for me, it's like if C.J. Stroud is not even the most outstanding player on his roster, it's really hard to to vote him as the Heisman. Um, and frankly. I don't know. I know Ohio State fans were up in arms about no Blitnikoff finalists, but I'm not sure how you choose among those three wide receivers. Yeah, who do you, you say know, is right? better between Olave, Wilson, and yeah? Yeah, it's just it's it's crazy. So I don't know. It's 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 not easy to vote, and um, you can probably rationalize any vote you make, especially this year. And I I want to say anybody that's really upset about Kenneth Walker is like, tell me who you're kicking out. Is it is it C.J. Stroud who had you know top of the like near the top of the country efficiency touchdowns all these things. Um, is it Pickett, who you mentioned, led a, a team to a Power 5 championship with one other guy on his offense that's going to get drafted and it's not even going to be this year? He's a sophomore, his receiver. That's really, really good. I mean, the the other guys that are there are also deserving. I think that's that's tough with the Heisman is that I, I personally think they would do themselves a lot of favors if you got to five. I don't think you can really argue six. when you get When you say four – there's always going to be that fifth. It's like, oh, we're right there, too. I think the Heisman Trust could do themselves a lot of favors by just making a five-man finalist pool. And, you know, what's that do? Add five more minutes to the hour, two-hour-long broadcast that's too long? Like, I don't know. I guess I oh, don't. I see what you're saying. I thought you were saying the voting system because Major League Baseball does oh, 10, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Yep. Okay. Where Do you think that changes anything if you're, if you're opening up and, um, you know, if you're – it probably doesn't change the – no, I don't think it changes the top. I think it just more accurately shows like the the true top five. Because when we get to that, when you have that three, you just especially if there's a consensus. Like let's say a couple of years ago with Joe Burrow, where he was like the consensus number one, right? I, I think when you get to the top, when you allow a top five voting, it just shows a more representation of like okay, where where were these guys actually slotted, and where did people think they were, right? Yeah, that's fair. Do you think Jalen Berger is going to be a All Big Ten running back next year for Michigan State? I don't. Okay. <laughs> I I question. You know, maybe there's some motivation there uh, because it's probably going to be his job walking in. Um, you know, we've heard throughout. You know, some of our sources is that the market wasn't super hot for for Jalen Berger on the on the transfer trail. Um, and we'll we'll see what happens there at Michigan State. But I just it, it's hard to it's hard to get somebody to work hard. If that's just not part of their nature, and maybe it is, we'll see. But yeah, maybe a change of scenery, you know. Yeah, maybe maybe just reset, right. hit the reset button, go to a new school, and you know maybe he has a great career. I, that's the problem. You know, I don't think athletically or you know playing his position is going to be an issue for him. I just think that there's it's between the ears for that kid, and we'll see what happens for him. I, I'm I'm rooting for him in the sense of I just think he was a nice guy, and I have no personal issues with him. Just you know I question how well it's going to work out for him. Right. I agree with that. 
All right. So, like I said, we're going to keep this episode a little bit shorter. Next week, we'll be talking some recruiting. I don't know the timing on next week because with signing day on Wednesday, uh, it's going to be super busy. I don't want to record pre-signing day and then have this podcast be old. So, it might be a little bit of a later drop next week. We'll see. But you will have a signing day podcast from us. And then we will see going forward. But, like I said, we will have a big game preview podcast later on in the month. Can I put you on the spot? Absolutely. Billy Shroth, UW or Notre Dame? Oh, I thought they were going to lose Tommy Reese, and that was going to change things. They kept him, so I think it's still 50-50. I, 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 it seems like he's leaning more toward Notre Dame. Billy Stroud, the uh, St. Mary Springs uh, stud offensive lineman. So I think he was leaning more toward Notre Dame. We'll see what the, if the coaching change had any type of effect on him. or I don't know. Notre Dame's people seem confident, confident and just – very excited about Marcus Freeman. Yeah, and no, I, I've I've listened to him talk. He's he's very impressive, and I can understand why they why they um, moved so quickly to keep him. Yeah, uh, Carson Hinsman. I think Carson Hinsman's here. Okay, I I just I don't know. I, I I think he's more of a more of a Wisconsin commit, or more of like a I'm not not I won't say sure thing, but more trending toward Wisconsin than than Schrouther. Any of the other top guys that are kind of still on the board. We talked about this in a meeting last week. This is completely um, strange that to have not only to have Wisconsin guys waiting this long to make commitments, but Wisconsin offensive linemen waiting this long. I mean, those typically are guys that are committed as sophomores or early juniors, and it's just it's this is rare, right? And I think part of it was the the interest that they got. Sure. So early because, like, usually, because you're right, usually when that happens, it's because Wisconsin sees them early on and is like, oh, okay, let's get him offered and be the first one in the door and talk to him a bunch. So then when these other offers start coming in, but they're either already committed or they've already built a really strong relationship, I feel like these guys were known nationally about as fast as Wisconsin could get, you know, in contact with them. So I think it's just a little bit different situation than we've seen in years past, but I think it does also show like, this is these are important recruits just for this staff and you know kind of proof case of hey we're doing the right things even though we don't have the resources or the you know the staff that other schools have and we're going to have a story on that later on in the month here but I think these are important guys to get or be very very close on in the next weeks or so. Very interesting to me, probably only me that I wrote this column last week about how. There are some changes that I think Paul Chris needs to consider, and two of the guys that I think he needs to consider um, moving on from are Joe Rudolph and Chris Herring. So log on to Twitter the night that story runs, and there's a picture of Chris Herring uh, and Rudolph with um, Brunner. Yeah, yeah, after Brunner. Yeah, because they're making their rounds uh, doing in-home visits. So I thought that was interesting. It was. All right. Well, we're going to keep it short, like I said, but uh, make sure you're on Aston.com, getting signed up and uh, checking out all of our work, not only here in sports, but then everything that we cover uh, across Madison and across Wisconsin. So lots of great work on Aston.com for you guys to check out. Make sure you're following Jim on Twitter at Jim Polzine WSJ, and you can follow me as well, CBART WSJ on Twitter there. So thank you guys very much for listening. We'll be back next week.